views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. As we well know, there are many comorbidities that many people said were going to increase the number of uh, COVID infections we had in the Bronx, and they listed asthma and diabetes and uh, obesity. But one of the other comorbidities is drug abuse, and we've had many, many uh, uh, drug deaths and uh, opioid overdoses in the Bronx, well more than our share, and uh, it certainly has contributed uh, to the infection rate. I'm going to give you a, a statistic here. Drug overdoses, now get this, take more lives in New York City than homicides, suicides, and car accidents combined. And so uh, right in the middle of the pandemic, right in the middle of uh, post-election madness, uh, it's never a bad time to talk about solving uh, this very, very difficult issues. And uh, we have a couple of people who have really rolled up their sleeves and uh, put together uh, the Bronx Opioid Collective Impact Project. So it is my pleasure to welcome from the Acacia Network, uh, Dr. David Collimore. Nice to have you with us, Dr. Collimore. My pleasure. And also uh, the council member from the 17th Council District in the South Bronx. Always nice to see council member Rafael Salamanca Jr. Nice to have you with us, councilman. Gary, thank you for having me. Uh, Dr. Collimore, let's start with you. Uh, you. You know, we talk about it takes a village. We talk about a, a problem. And, you know, I, I recall uh, being actually in, in the neighborhood, right? Uh, uh, we also, by the way, have to congratulate the Third Avenue bid for their partnership. I was right down there in that area and I saw a, a young man stressed out on the, on the sidewalk there and the police came by. You know, this just didn't seem to me to be the way we're going to solve this problem. It means the, it, the way we're only going to recycle the problem. So Dr. Collymore, why don't you give me uh, the background of why Acacia uh, Network decided to do this and uh, bringing in um, uh, partners or maybe a council member may have started the whole thing, but why the council member and the Third Avenue bid were important in this community-wide effort. Absolutely. And uh, let me say thank you once again for this uh, opportunity to, to chat with you. Um, you know, the, the Acacia Network has been, been doing this work for, for decades, you know, in terms of pro providing health care and housing and substance use disorder services to, uh, to the communities that we, that we serve. Um, but the reality is we're, we're in the midst of an, an epidemic, a pandemic of substance use disorder. Um, and on top of that, added in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and even prior to this pandemic, we said, well, is, is there something else that we could do? Um, you know, what more can we do to address the needs in the communities that we serve? And I think this, this project um, really demonstrates uh, the benefits of the intersection of uh, provider networks such as Acacia um, government uh, with the, uh, the support of, of uh, um, Councilman Salamanca and, and his vision and his, his willingness to, uh, to, to engage in, in addressing this issue. Um, and then also of, of local business. Um, and, and it really takes that intersection and that, that collaboration um, for us to, to move the needle and to look at additional opportunities for, for improvement. So um, uh, this is a great, a great model for, uh, for the world to see. Are there differences between, I mean, you talked about Acacia's long service in this area. Are there differences now uh, between um, what, what's going on now and the difficulties in addressing this problem now than there were, uh, you know, 25 years ago? Or is it really essentially we're just still fighting the same beast? Well, there, there, there are significant um, differences uh, just in, in sort of the pharmacology of it. Um, I think the, the, uh, the addition of fentanyl as a, a factor that we are combating makes the, uh, the issue of overdose far more, more prevalent um, and far more difficult to, uh, to address. 
Um, I think that, that's one of the, the marked differences um, in terms of what we're dealing with. Um, substance use disorder has evolved through the years. Um, I, I think our treatment modalities uh, have evolved also, um, but, uh, but there are more challenges now than there were um, decades ago. Uh, and more challenges, you say, because there may be more accessibility, uh, and as you say, fentanyl, the introduction of fentanyl into the process. So it's not only, you know, heroin or um, e even, uh, uh, you know, we've had all kinds of uh, uh, drug epidemics uh, in, in, in crack and, of course, uh, other epidemics. So you're saying it just added, it was like pile it up, you know, we added more and more. Council member, um, how difficult is it to put this kind of coalition together? I know in your work, and you and I have had so many discussions about these kinds of things, but really to solve them, you really got to put a community together. Is, is it tough in this day and age, especially, uh, to, to get people on the same page? Well, Gary, first, thank you for having me here um, to talk on a very special subject that's dear to me and, and, and is dear to the South Bronx, which is opioid use. You know, Gary, uh, 149th Street and 3rd Avenue, I consider ground zero for opioid users in the borough of the Bronx. And when you sit back and you look at why and, and you try to figure out what are the factors, well, think about it. You have methadone clinics. You have needle exchange programs, you have homeless shelters that are safe havens, all concentrated on the intersection of 149th Street and 3rd Avenue. And what has happened is that users tend to congregate there and that is where, and, and, and that's how it's spreading in that immediate area. When I first came into office in 2016, I took over my predecessor's physical office and it was on 149th Street and 3rd Avenue. And so for about four months, I observed you know, and I lived what was actually happening in this community. Um, and, and I looked around and there are many not-for-profits in that area that are doing good work, but I don't think that many of them were talking to each other as to how they're going to work together collectively and address the issue. So I sat down with Acacia, um, with Raul Rusi, who, who is the presidency of Acacia, and I said, Raul, we need to do something here. We need to bring in these um, not-for-profits. We need to sit together. Many of them are doing the same thing, but the addiction is in our face. My constituents are upset. People are shooting up in their face. How do we work together? How do we address the issue? And so the idea of working with the Third Avenue bid, Acacia and my office and bringing in these non-for-profits, that's how we, uh, we form the collective. Now, the power that elected officials have is the power of the budget. I knew in order for this collective to be, uh, to, uh, to, to work and this collective, um, we needed to provide funding so that they can hire individuals, so that they can organize and we could put street teams in the street. And so for the last three years, I was able to allocate $250,000 uh, to, to Acacia for the collective so that they can get the work done. Uh, when you look at uh, uh, the, the, the problems and the issues, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to as I'm going to go back to what I said originally about um, you know I saw somebody who was um, overdosed on the street and I saw police officers attending to them. Um, talk to me about what we really need to do with that person to get them out you know uh, back to a point of health. Uh, you know it's such a um, it, it's such a complex issue. Uh, and then, of course, um, you know, we could <laughs> get into the quote unquote defund the police question. Asking police officers to do it really complicates a lot of things in the city. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take a, a first stab at, at responding okay. to, uh, to that. Um, you know, I, I would say uh, one of the things that we found is that that substance use disorder is not a one size fits all um, approach to, to each uh, individual situation. So we have to meet that person at the point where they are. We have to see what their needs are. Um, we have to see what their situation is. There's so many uh, confounding factors that lead someone into that position or into that state. Um, ultimately, the, the goal is to get that individual into treatment, um, to get them free of using illicit substances. But we also have to understand that there's a process um, that that individual has to go through, and that process begins with engagement. One of the one of the things with the uh, with the opioid collective impact project, um, the benefit of that is you know, we're not waiting for folks to come with, within our four walls to, uh, to engage them and to address them. Um, our, our peers, our, our workers, our staff are out in the street engaging folks at the point of their need, where they are, engaging them, seeing exactly what is it that they, that they need at that moment. Is it, is it food? Is it, uh, is it clothing? Um, 
you know, harm reduction uh, modalities have been proven to be effective in, in limiting the uh, spread of disease. You know, do they, do they support in that? And then beginning with that connection and then engaging in the conversation of, we have detox services that are available to you. We have treatment services that are available to you. What do we need to do to meet you where you are to get you into treatment and get you onto a more functional life? You know, it's very easy to say, well, you know, stop taking drugs or treat, uh, uh, let's say, the the um, uh, the addiction specifically. I mean, that can be done. And as a, the council member mentioned, there are methadone clinics right right there on 149th and 3rd. They're uh, prominent, frankly. Um, but there are factors that go into causing people to take drugs. And, you know, and, and I, I will start with you, Dr. Collymore, but I definitely want to bring uh, Councilman uh, Salamanca in on this. Um, Poverty, uh, uh, joblessness, certainly hunger, uh, uh, could be a, a domestic strife of some sort. Um, can uh, uh, or do we have enough resources to deal with these? These are just monumental problems. I believe they all start in many ways with poverty. But uh, Dr. Collymore, uh, just your thoughts about if we're really going to address this, you know, do we need to really look at society's ills in addition to the... Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that, that's uh, quite, quite a question. Yeah, <laughs> it's quite a question. I mean, to, if, if, you know, if I were to say that I felt that we had enough, then we would not have the issue. You know, um, I, I think the, the, the reality is that, um, you know, this, this epidemic of substance use disorder is, is, um, is, is a significant challenge, and, and we don't have everything that we need um, in order to, to address it. We have some powerful tools and we're, we're getting better day after day. Um, I think the collaboration is key, not working in silos is key, um, but addressing poverty and addressing, you know, an individual's mental health and addressing uh, a history of trauma. Um, those, are, those are significant challenges that, that, um, that I, I will not profess to say that we have the answer to all of those ills at this time, um, but That's together, good. together we can, we, can move the, uh, we can move the needle and, and, uh, and get closer to the market. Councilman, Gary, I know uh, opioid, all the time. Yeah, Gary, opioid has been ravishing our communities in the Bronx for decades. Um, you know, in the 70s, the 80s, you know, the, the, the crack epidemic, the heroin epidemic. And, you know, we, we, we in the South Bronx, we were sounding the alarm for years. Um, but, you know, it wasn't until wealthier white communities started suffering from the opioid epidemic that government started to pay attention. And so that's what I call systemic racism, right? We, it's affecting our communities. The resources were trickling in, but they were, we were not getting the resources that we needed so that we can address the issue. Now that, the re, now that government has woken up and they are paying attention to what's happening and they're putting in resources and they're putting in dollars in to address this opioid epidemic, we are the experts now. These not-for-profits that are in the South Bronx are the experts. So they should be leading the way and government should be working with these not-for-profits to see how can we provide the funding necessary so that we can bring, so that we can bring positive outcomes to our communities. And it doesn't just lead to providing services for those individuals that are, that are addicted. And Gary, you hit the nail on the head. Poverty, housing, education, those are all factors that may lead to someone being depressed and choosing to 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 um to use to utilize drugs and form an addiction. So you know we need to not only address the addiction issue that we have, but we also have to give residents and in, in communities that are poor the resources that they need so that they can overcome these barriers that are around us. Councilman, I know you'll understand this very well. We had uh, DA uh, Darso Clark on the show a, a week or two ago. And she talked about in her gun buyback program, what she did was she offered iPads to anybody who turned in a, a gun with the idea that we are, if we give them an iPad, it will give them an alternative to something that caused them to think that a gun was the solution. In other words, solve a problem for a family, help their children do better in school, those kinds of things. Can I assume you're in complete sync with this and this is the kind of thing, the kind of 
you know, out of the box thinking we need when we look at um, uh, opioids council. Absolutely, absolutely. I commend ourselves, Clark, for really thinking out of the box and partnering with um, other organizations. I, I believe it was the Yankees that she partnered with that provided these iPads. You know, um, I'm a big supporter of the gun buyback program where we're physically, you know, we're physically giving individuals money so that we can take these guns um, off the streets. Um, you know, but honestly, you know, when you when you look at how COVID has affected our communities, it's affected directly the the Bronx because we were physically not ready to uh, to address or to deal with a pandemic such as this one. Um, look, not, COVID did not only affect our health; it affected our economy. It affected our educational system. Look at what you know. A few weeks ago, I had a press conference with the borough president and other Bronx elected officials because we have kids that are at home doing remote learning without technology necessary so that they can do remote learning. Now, the city is giving them technology, but some of this technology, now they don't have access to Wi-Fi. They don't have access to broadband, you know? And so how are, how are they physically learning? They're not. And there are other barriers here in terms of, um, you know, we have families who have language barriers. And if you don't have access to technology to do remote learning with a teacher, you're expecting the parent to provide you, you're expecting a parent who has a language barrier and is not an educator to educate that student. And so just to bring the conversation back here, these are all challenges that underserved communities suffer from. And many times uh, this, these, um, these challenges can form uh, depression to families, which can lead to addiction. And, and, and we need to address that as government, working together with not-for-profits who are the experts and let them lead the way. Um, on that note, uh, Dr. Collymore, um, what uh, effect has uh, uh, the COVID pandemic had on the problem? Uh, can we assume it's made it worse? Can we assume it's made it more difficult for providers to, uh, to get in there and do what they need to do? Or is, is, you know, is, is, is a drug treatment kind of going on as it was? Well, I mean, I mean, without a doubt, uh, I think the pandemic has made every aspect of our lives more difficult. Um, you know, the, the beginning with sort of the, the, the mental um, stress, the anxiety, the depression um, is that at astronomical proportions at, at this time. And that has led to uh, uh, additional or more frequent uh, substance use. Um, so statistics will tell us we, we've seen increases in, in, in overdoses throughout the, throughout the nation. Um, so it has been extremely, uh, extremely challenging. Um, I commend the, uh, the, the, the peers and the staff of, of this Opioid Collective Impact Project um, because they, they really didn't skip a beat. Um, you know, we, we regrouped and we said, well, how can we safely um, continue to uh, uh, render these services to the, uh, to the community? Um, so our, our folks um, were back out there, um, still doing their food distribution, still doing syringe uh, uh, pickups, um, still engaging folks and getting them into treatment. Uh, the doors of Acacia never closed. Um, our outpatient treatment programs continue to render services. Uh, you know, our residential facilities continue to house individuals. Our health centers continue to care for, for individuals throughout the pandemic. Um, it made it more difficult. You know, there, there were some challenges. There were some some nuances that we had to, uh, to 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 overcome, and some things that we had to add to our portfolio. Um, the implementation of telehealth, uh, getting technology to individuals that did not have technology. So partnering with the, the case managers and the management of residential facilities and housing locations to make sure that they provided technology for individuals so that we could care for them. Um, but it absolutely did make the uh, the task uh, significantly more difficult. Um, but we did not stop uh, focusing on our mission. Uh, I'm, our producer, Stephen Powell, will be putting uh, contact information because people watching, you may know somebody who, uh, uh, you know, has a, um, a problem or you may suspect somebody has a problem or you want to get a friend help. Uh, so we'll put all that contact info uh, up on the screen. Um, Dr. Collimore, I want to ask you about the syringe exchange programs and how we deal with syringes. I looked up in my own records, and, and this is really how far back this problem goes in the Bronx. When we started Bronx Talk in 1994, uh, 26 years ago, I, I think it was January 1995, I did my uh, a program, I was probably about um, 10 shows into the life of this program on needle exchanges. 
and it was um, which just shows you how long we've been in the Bronx. We've been dealing with this very serious problem. Um, do needle exchanges work? Because it's very controversial. They're saying, "What are you crazy? You're giving people fresh needles. I mean, you're you're only encouraging it." But I I believe the harm reduction numbers do show that needle exchange programs really do work. Certainly uh, combating the spread of uh, HIV and AIDS and other uh, diseases and illnesses that are, uh, you know, communicated through the sharing of needles. So why don't we just talk about that aspect of it? Because it's still controversial. And frankly, there's still people who, are, for, for good reasons, don't really understand it. Right, right. Um, you know, the, the Acacia Network, we, we provide a, a whole host of services um, in the substance disorder realm and, and housing and, and in healthcare. One of the things that we do not directly provide is, uh, is syringe exchange. Um, and that's why this collective was so important for us to partner with organizations that do specialize in that and that do do that. But the, the, the numbers and the stats, um, they, they, they're clear. They, they've proven that it decreases transmission of HIV. It decreases transmission of hepatitis C. Um, so there, there are a whole host of benefits. It, it decreases the incidence of skin infections in individuals that are using intravenous drugs. Um, so the benefits are, are, are clear and the, and the numbers demonstrate that, that, that those harm reduction tactics do work. Um, there are other harm reduction um, modalities such as uh, distribution of Narcan, which have also been uh, proven to, to be effective in saving lives. Um, so, so all of those together, um, again, it's no, there's not one answer to a complex uh, uh, problem, um, but together with utilizing all of those different modalities and the partnership of the organizations and the partnership of government and the partnership of local business, that's what a lot has allowed us to be successful. Uh, Council member, you talked about a quarter of a million dollars that you were able to get to put toward this program. You know, when I think about um, the, the kinds of funding that we really need to really do this, um, and now that the city's budget is, uh, you know, I, I'll put it in a word, it's a mess because, because of COVID, we know what's going on. Um, is, is this gonna be a hard fight? Where is this on the priority list of uh, the city's budget? Well, Gary, you know, in this fiscal year, because of, of COVID, how the effect that it had in the economy, every city agency took a cut. And, um, and so we're, we're now in fiscal year 21. In fiscal year 20, I was able to allocate $300,000 for the collective. And, and because of the cuts, this uh, collective took a hit of $50,000, which by the way, I, had, I fought for, you know, and, um, but, but there was an understanding that every city agency was taking a cut. However, the opioid crisis is, a, is also a health epidemic, it's also a health crisis. And we, we as elected leaders, at least this council member that represents the Bronx and represents the South Bronx and sits in the budget negotiating team at City Hall, will continue to advocate and will continue to ensure that we are providing funding for organizations to provide services to combat the opioid crisis. I had addressed uh, the notion of police officers dealing with an overdose person in the street. Um, how do you view, uh, I don't know if we need to get into the whole defund the police question, but whose responsibility could it be if um, uh, resources are allocated in another way so that if that very unfortunately common scenario that I saw that a, you know, a young man was just overdosed in the street, um, that the police can go do their crime fighting thing and not have to deal with this uh, social service problem. In, in other words, how, how, would, how would you reallocate that, whether in money or in simply you know, a job assignment? Yeah. Well, well, Gary, you know, when someone calls 911, uh, normally you, you, um, and, and you're, you're calling 911 for an ambulance, um, many times the police arrive, they're, they're there to respond. Um, and, um, and then the ambulance comes and I, I, sometimes even the fire department comes. Um, you know, I know that the NYPD has also been trained to, uh, to administer Narcan to save a life. At the end of the day, you know, we wanna, we wanna save lives. And that's the whole purpose of this collective. Is it the responsibility of NYPD? Absolutely not. Um, but I do know that when, when you do call 911, PD responds and they get the ambulance in and, and, and ensure that they get proper treatment. But something that I wanna be clear here, we're not gonna get out of the opioid crisis by arresting people and putting people in jail. That is not the answer here. The answer is, 
is getting them the help that they need, getting them the support services that they need so that they can, they, can, um, they can get rid of this addiction and they can go and help their peers. And that is what this collective does. And that's what I'm doing with Acacia. That's what I'm doing with the Third Avenue bid. And that's what I'm doing with the 15 not-for-profits that are participating uh, in this collective. Uh, Dr. Collymore, a final question for you. Uh, people who have questions, people who want advice, people who want uh, resources, how do they get to Acacia Network? All right, before, before I jump into uh, to respond to that question, I just wanna um, highlight and, and thank Councilman Salamanca for his continued support. I can only imagine in the midst of this pandemic how hard he had to fight for that continued funding. So um, we, we, we were concerned um, because we, we see what's happening in, in, the, in the economy. Um, so we, I just wanted to say that on behalf of everyone at Acacia, all of the providers, all of the staff, um, I'm sure Raul has thanked you per, uh, personally, um, but, but thank you for your continued support. Um, the question of who should respond to an overdose, I think that's everybody's responsibility. So, so we have to empower everyone, churches, businesses, uh, family members, everyone to be able to, uh, to respond. Um, and in terms of how can you get in contact with Acacia, um, we will uh, we'll share our information in terms of our, our call center phone number, our website. Um, we have a number of locations throughout the city, throughout the state, throughout the nation, uh, services that include community health centers, inpatient detox and rehab, a skilled nursing facility, transitional housing, supportive housing, uh, workforce development. So, so I think the, the bottom line is there, pick up the phone and call, get online and uh, let's do it. Right. Uh, yeah. Council member, two quick questions for you just before we go. You are the chair of land use. We never get a chance to talk to you. Uh, um, how are we doing in land use? Has it been uh, uh, development terribly affected uh, by the pandemic? I mean, are you seeing you know, developers backing off of projects that maybe you were hopeful about? Gary, look, um, pre-COVID, one of the main issues that we had with HPD who uh, was closing on projects. In the council, we would rezone land so we can build affordable housing. And once that passes, the next stage, it will go to HPD so that they can provide the subsidy so they can close. And we had issues with HPD closing pre-COVID. We have more issues with HPD, HPD post-COVID. Um, it's a challenge. I know that recently the mayor uh, in, in the Office of, of, of Budget, OMB, they released uh, $500 million so that we can go back into uh, putting dollars into capital projects so that we can start rebuilding. Um, again, Gary, you know, with this epidemic, uh, our economy has been shot and the way to rebuild this economy is to create jobs. And one of the best ways to create jobs is to uh, build infrastructure. And, and that's how you get people back to work. I've got to ask you this question. Every, you know, people move uh, through seniority in the city council a lot faster now than they ever did. Your name is coming up and being whispered as uh, somebody who'd be interested in being the next speaker of the city council. Any interest? Um, I'm weighing my options, Gary. You know, I have many options, whether it's the speaker of the city council or being the next borough president. Uh huh. Boy, oh boy, did Gary just open up a can of worms there. <laughs> uh, council member, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for your great work in uh, supporting people in need in uh, the borough of the Bronx. Um, and collectively, uh, maybe we can solve uh, some of these problems. We appreciate your time. And uh, Dr. David Collymore, thank you so much, sir. Uh, and all my friends at Acacia, you just do great work and we, we got nothing if we don't have you. And we really appreciate your time. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, folks, uh, we'll see you next week on uh, Bronx Talk. We're going to do something really special next week. Uh, and so uh, stick around. Uh, I, I'm going to give it away. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, do a, a holiday show that you're really going to enjoy. Uh, good night.